think we're sort of live. Starting a minute early so I can check all of the places. Yeah, that's working so far. Oops. This is not working yet. Oops. Excellent. Okay, so if you're joining me, sorry, I'm I'm trying a new thing, which is uh, I'm doing uh, restream.io, which is splitting my stream into two places, and I'm using their web app to, as the interface. Uh, but what that allows me to do is I can see your comments from both YouTube and uh, Twitch. And if you want to help me out, you can go between the two and see if one of them is better or worse for you and uh, try to type something in the comments there and, you know, generally just kind of <clears throat> see if it comes through on my end. I should be able to see everything on my computer and uh, sort of interact with the chat. Uh, we're going to do some more practicing today. Uh, if you are, uh, uh, somebody just texted me a little earlier and wanted to, uh, oh, he wants to play. Yeah. So Eric, if you're watching, um, tell me where to send you a link. And I would love to test another thing on this that apparently I can invite people to my stream. Uh, I don't know what that looks like. So if you want to, if you want to do that, then, uh, I guess email me and I can email you back the link. I think that's probably the easiest. Um, Email me at my Gmail if you, it's just gabrielvincentdmartino at gmail.com. So that's my normal professional email uh, and not my school one because I don't have that one up right now. Uh, you could also, I could just drop it in the chat, but then anybody can do it. So, uh, and I, just in case we have uh, a, well, I guess it wouldn't be a Zoom bomb, but it would be kind of like a Zoom bomb if I just dropped in the chat because then some jerk that's just going through live streams. I don't know why they'd be online, but it's just not the best because I uh, I only get the one link, so I can't redo it. Anyway, um, so yeah, we're going to play some of my students' lesson material again today. Uh, because I didn't get to it and kept saying that I would last week, we are going to start with the Hoffman Four Miniatures, which is one of my grad students is doing one or maybe two of. So I'm going to practice a little bit of the one that he's unsure of and, uh, and try to maybe get over to the one that I'm less sure of, which is the first one. Um, so the fourth one, we're going to start with the fourth one. And uh, I play this on B-flat trumpet. Um, does it say? Let's, let's question that. It does say B-flat trumpet right there. So uh, I don't think that means you have to play it on B-flat trumpet, but it means it's OK. Uh, it's, a lot of people play modern. This is an unaccompanied piece. A lot of people play unaccompanied pieces on C trumpet as written. I guess that's fine too, but why why play it up a step when you can play it down a step, right? So I uh, I'm going to play B flat as written, and um, let's get started. I'm also going to use a uh, oh the only thing is I can't tell how many people are watching. I think no, that's okay. All right. So. Uh, Oh, I can actually, I can see one person is watching. Uh, you can't see what I can see, but um, so yeah, hopefully it's it's my student who needs to hear, uh, to, who needs to watch this. <clears throat> so this is gonna be the fourth movement of Hoffman. And um, I'm not gonna just jump in and play the beginning. I mean, I guess I could just for you for the stream, but it's not how I would practice. And I wanna be a good practicer. I am also gonna use a timer today, uh, to a countdown timer. I worked out, that I can roughly spend six minutes on each piece uh, if I want to get through them all. And I'm sure some things will take me two minutes and some things will take me 12 minutes. But if I kind of have an idea and I'll, I'll mark down what each thing takes me, that way I know if I have a little more time on one thing or another. But before I talk away all my extra time, let's start the timer and begin. So I'm not going to start with uh, the beginning of the piece because the beginning of the piece is real easy. Uh, just eighth notes, you know, sort of these these little intervals and things like that. Uh, but I could start with the first thing that looks really difficult, but I'm going to actually go to the middle. There's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle that I just am not sure. And I'm not even going to start with the piece because I haven't played in about a half hour. And so I'm a little bit cold again. I, I taught a lesson, but then we did some restreaming uh, stuff. Uh, my students helped me get all this calibrated and ready, ready to go. So um, 
So I, I haven't played in actually more like an hour. So we're going to get back into the horn and just kind of get my lip vibrating again and make sure I'm not doing anything just to get the notes out. All right. Like if I, if I got that note out on purpose, it might be kind of not the best way to play. And even though the note didn't come out, I can just try again. It's helping me not spend a lot of time, uh, waste a lot of time rather, not getting notes that I think I should be able to, and then working on that section like it's hard when I just wasn't really warmed up, right? So now that we've done that a little bit, <clears throat> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that forever. Uh, I am sort of interested to see if my, uh, if my view counts are different in different places. So I'm gonna pull these back up, but keep them muted. Uh, just to see if there are people in other places that are watching. And um, this is kind of interesting to me. We're eventually going to do this on three platforms. Uh, we're going to do it on uh, Facebook Live as well. And if I can get it, uh, Instagram. And uh, then we'll be simul, simul streaming on a bunch of different places. So um, that might that might get a, a larger audience and then therefore more people might play. And then that means I can help more people and that's kind of what this is about, right? So, uh, no, I don't see anything different there. Uh, I'm gonna close this computer so it doesn't die. All right, so now we're warmed up. We're gonna learn this piece. Uh, now, I, I, can't, uh, I can't put you on, I can't, I can't share this with you without violating uh, copyright, so, so to speak, but you can see the middle section there is complicated looking, let's say. So I'm going to start right at the top of it because a lot of times I'll tell my students start at the end, right? I'll say start with the last lick, and that is good, uh, but you have to be able to do a whole uh, a whole lick at once and then back it off and do that lick by itself and then add them together. Um, and sometimes that's confusing. So a lot of times with a piece like this, especially going forwards through a section, might be a better approach because the the there might be development that actually helps you hear the line better. Uh, that you won't get if you go backwards. You'll get a sort of reverse development. So you'll still be hearing it better and better as you go forward, uh, which is the point of going backwards, but you won't, it will be harder to learn that way. And you might struggle and spend a lot of time just on the same lick for a long time. So anyway, before we run out of time on this piece already, um, I'm at a lick that I definitely can't play. So far, okay. There's some sevenlets. There's some fivelets. I'm not getting super note accurate yet, but uh, I can work on that, right? So let's let's work on this lick that I just got to. So it's it's a sevenlet that sounds like. But there's a grace note on the second one. You kind of got to fit it all in, right? And it is possible. I, I can use a metronome on this, but I'd rather sort of use my own sense of pulse first and then get a metronome on it. So we'll get a metronome ready. I'm going to spend a little more time on this than uh, the six minutes that I said I would. So yeah, da, 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 It's kind of 50 is good. It says slow as the tempo, so I'm not going to worry too much about that, but... I'm going to reset my timer. Um, so if I'm if I, that's what I'm trying to go, I'm going to have to go a little slower than that. Um, All 
right, so just getting that under my fingers again. I've worked on this one before, but... And now I might put a metronome on, try to fit it into the... Oh, boy. No, I'm, I'm going too fast in the settlement. So that's about as fast as I can accurately play it. Let's do that again. And I'm, I'm going to boff that low B flat a bunch, but I'm not going to worry about it right now and try to force it out. I've got a lot of stuff to play through. Let's add some more to it. Let's see if it just comes out naturally. Uh, let's see. Let's try to play the whole section with a metronome. part about this movement is there's a lot of fivelets that you really want to play evenly. You can you can pull back pull back on the first note of them and make them a little more dramatic and that makes them easier to play because you're making the rhythm a little less accurate, right? We can play it sort of let's see. You can sort of pull on the edges of it to make those notes kind of lead better into the next thing or into the lick. Uh, that's okay, I think, but it's not impossible to just sort of lean on them um, in emphasis, but not with extra time. And if you need that extra time, then, you know, take it, I guess. Better, it's, it's nice to be able to play this piece no matter what. And then you can work on how even the rhythms are a little bit later uh, because they really just need to flow well, right? So if you need to take a little more time to do that at first, as long as you're working on it, right? If you're just going to say, well, it's it's an unaccompanied piece, so I don't have to play exactly a sevenlet, then yeah, you do. He could just write whatever he wanted to, and he wrote a seven. So you should play a seven, I think. Um, so I don't know. that Maybe that maybe that's controversial. And so, okay, great. It's controversial. That's what I think. Um, now, let's we can play a little bit of the beginning just so you can get a sense of how this piece sounds. And I'm going to go... I want to go a little faster. It says approximately 48 at the beginning and then slightly faster and lyric at the section I just started. I don't know if I can play it. I mean, slightly faster is two, I guess, right? So I could play this first section slower. Uh, but you got to be careful with unaccompanied music because if you play it too slow, it lasts longer and that can be a, dead, a death sentence in your recitals because uh, you can't get through it all of a sudden. So I'm going to go a little faster and just kind of Figure out, figure out what feels right, and then I can put some numbers to it uh, after the fact, right? the beginning a little bit. Um, and there's one little connecting section, but I think we've sort of covered what this movement has to do in it. And uh, you've really got to work out every rhythm. And you heard me singing a lot. Anytime I, uh, I'm i not sure about what I'm playing or I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong, I'm going to start singing. And that way I'm not wasting my lip trying to figure it out. I'm I'm just, I'm, I'm wasting my vocal cords, which I waste all day. <clears throat> so let's look a little bit at the first movement. My timer's going to go out for the second time here, uh, so I'll have to put a 12 on the Hoffman. But uh, there's nothing really different about this movement 
uh, except that cause it's also a slow movement, but uh, all the sounds are different. And um, it's a little more free, right? It says slowly, but very free. So, so I guess it's a lot more free, right? So this, this would be the time when you can say like, well, you know, if he's going to write six and a half, four, then I'm not going to take that seven tuplet over one, two, three beats too seriously, right? But I do want to play it evenly. Uh, but I also get this freedom, right? So this one is a little bit better um, where you don't, you don't have to be so rhythmically precise. Um, so I just, I look at the hard licks again. Um, and then I want to make a big contrast, right? So, so here's, uh, let's see. Uh, so I can't breathe there. Uh, use my pencil to mark that I breathe after that note because there's a rest. So these are sort of, this is in the middle of the piece again. I just played, uh, between the sort of sem sempre legato. I didn't really play that legato. Right, that part and this deliberate, uh, deliberate, how I try to say it in Italian, deliberate, uh, deliberate section, right? And then delicate is the next one. Well, I didn't play all of it, but say to get faster either sorry uh but so how do you make that delicate you can sort of lift it you know probably not loud right it does crescendo but you could just try to make it a real gossamer kind of ethereal sound right that's delicate as well. So you have to sort of interpret that a little bit. Um, I would love to learn who Dr. E.M. Turrentine is. If anybody knows, that is a research I have not done, I'm sad to say. But anyway, that's a little bit of the first movement that um, you really have to hear it well, which I'm not super great at doing right now. But uh, it's free. So it's all about, if it's, if it's free, freedom of, uh, of time, then you want to make sure the rhythms are clear even if you're playing with the time. So you can't play with it so much that you obscure that, um, at least not too much, right? And then that really means the piece is all about the pitch content more so than the rhythm. Uh, and it's maybe more about the sort of general speed of the rhythms than it is about the precise relationships to each other the way that the other one uh, is and some of the other movements. So that's what I think about this one. Uh, got to move on. So there's a little bit of Hoffman. Uh, we're going to do some Boza etudes now. And um, if you don't know about this book, the Boza book is an amazing book uh, because it's kind of sketches to his uh, actual pieces. Some of them are, not all of them. Uh, there are. It's it's not it's not a super great bargain. It's like twenty five dollars for sixteen etudes, but uh, but it's Boza, right? So. Of course, I want a Boza etude book. And it used to not be available. I have an old copy that's like spiral bound that is this book, but uh, from, from one of my former teachers. And uh, uh, yeah, he, he had it and said, hey, take this to Kinko's and copy it for the studio because you can't buy this anymore and I want to use it. So I did. And then I kept my copy. I don't know where it is right now, 
But then when it came available again, I was like, well, I should really buy it. And you should. You should not steal music. It's bad. It's a bad habit. Uh, when you're in college, you think, well, I, you know, I don't have any money. I can't get it. Well, that's still a good time. Like you have more disposable income than you think you do uh, earlier in life, right? So um, spend it on music. Spend it on recordings and sheet music. So anyway, here we go on Boat Saw. So the first one of these sounds just like, I'll play a little bit of it. Uh, we're also doing these as written on C trumpet for the student who's doing this. Oh, uh, so uh, hi, Travis. Um, the Hoffman piece is called Four Miniatures. I know I'm way behind. Uh, the stream is like super laggy because I'm doing this dual stream. So, um, but yeah, it's four miniatures. I'll show you. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful four movement uh, unaccompanied work that you can do one of or several of. Uh, and the, the, the second movement's really hard. The third movement has a uh, harmon mute with some difficult sort of wah-wah and like, you know, there, there's some stuff to work out physically uh, around the horn, not on the horn on that one. But they're all three really interesting, uh, really nice pieces. So I highly recommend the Hoffman Four Miniatures. And they're way easier to play than, um, oh, what's the other the other one I have in the other room? Um, there's another four, four, not miniatures, but four somethings. Uh, and it's like, I looked at it the other day and was like, uh, I, I think someone else is going to be an expert in this composer and piece. <laughs> so anyway, all right. So I'll play a little bit of this first etude just because it's cute uh, and it sounds just like a Bozo piece you probably know, and that'll give you an idea of what we're up against. And then I'll play some of the other one and actually work on it. So let's start our timer. get the idea it's i think i played this last week too actually um it's a nice etude it's not as nice as the pieces but it's that's why they're sort of studies and uh so we're we're considering doing a couple of other ones for next week uh i'm not going to play the beginnings of everything even though they're nice um because again they're not very difficult um or maybe i will i guess we should we should look at it at least right and uh number two is that so that was number one a little bit um just triple tonguing staying agile um really trusting your your production to get the work done instead of trying to just make every note count or make make every note come out uh you can't do it the the especially the triple tonguing you know uh these kind of you can't you can't play each one of those notes you gotta play through all those notes um so you know, there's, there's a lot to work on there that you can spend a lot of time on individual little spots and say like, yeah, can I get my production to play all of that for me? Or do I have to kind of goose a note out? And it's okay if you do, but now that's where you are for now. And you, you're going to have to work your way towards how do I not goose it out in the future? What, what of my routine am I, how am I addressing that every day? Right? So this is a different one. Uh, number two is, sounds like Bach at first. And uh, I think that's intentional. Um, he tells you, he gives you little pieces of advice in this book, which I think are, is, is kind of funny. It says to be studied very slowly, uh, or first very slowly, at a, uh, eighth note equals 52, which is roughly half tempo from what he, he says 100 is the normal tempo uh, to the quarter. So this is 52. Let's see. I mean, it's really slow. It would take a long time to play it that fast or that slowly. Uh, anyway, we're going to put it at 100, which is where you want. Again, I'm singing first because I want to make sure I know what this piece sounds like, right? If I just, now I got to get the first note. I almost guessed it, and then I thought, oh, I'm going to miss it on stream, and I would have got it. But this one, though, for me, is about color change. This whole etude is about 
different colors, right? And if you've studied with me on any of these kinds of self-accompanimental etudes, the note that doesn't change is like kind of the, the backbeat, right? It's kind of the accompaniment, right? And you're playing, right? You're playing this beautiful melody and they're just the offbeat accompaniment. So, but you get to do both of those parts, right? You have to, you have to, uh, you have to be able to play as two people, right? So I am going to go very, very slow at first, just so I can get that color change. In fact, let's do a little bit of Just get that color change revved up. And then it's hard because we have to start on the offbeat. So maybe I'll play the first three notes pretty even tone and then start changing just so that I don't I don't do something stupid with my production. All right. Oops, I did it backwards. It's, it's hard to do the top note darker. So that's not quite a hundred either, right? Yeah, not quite. Not quite is one way of putting it. But I don't want to go too fast. I want to. I really want to get into this color change thing, and you're going to see in a second. It's it's like the main event. This, this A2 can wear you out really fast, um, and it is doing me, uh, not the least of which is because I taught before this and, and played a lot this morning, but um, it's, just, it's just a mean set of things to try to do, and you can just play it, right? You can, there's a whole other school of thought to just like, well, let's just make it sound super even, because that's mostly what a violinist might be trying to do or something like that. And it's a lot easier to play that way. Um, I would argue that it's not as musically interesting, right? You're not, then you're not accompanying yourself. You're not trying to play with different colors. Um, and I think those colors sometimes occur naturally on other instruments and less so for us. Uh, but, you know, again, these are all just sort of <laughs> uh, radical opinions that I've formed over the years of being radicalized by all the different influences that I've had. So, uh, so I'll try to do that instead. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's easier to play. I missed more notes that time, but that's you know, that's not that's neither here nor there. Uh, but it's easier to get through the line. I could play for a lot longer that way. And sometimes you have to do that. And this is, a, this is a huge like dividing line between trumpet players a lot of times where do you want all the notes to sound the same or do you want to be able to change the sounds of all the notes? And uh, when you want to be able to change the sound, that means now you're responsible for the sounds of all the notes. And so if you screw up a little bit, well, you know, maybe you should have been in the other camp, right? But I think it's worth the risk. I, I like the customizability and I want the trumpet to do whatever it is I asked for, even when I ask for bad sounds, right? And I want to try to not ask for bad sounds most of the time. So anyway, that's this etude. Um, I could do another one, but there, the, 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 the things to do in them, I, what I didn't do in this one is this one really bad lick. And uh, I've sort of worked out, uh, my student who I just sent this to can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I marked in some of the uh, chords that he has you arpeggiate. So we can work on that a little bit. And this is like a, this is, every time I do this etude, I have to work on this exclusively for like a couple of days. So I'll play it very slow, like he says. We'll play it half tempo.
So you see why it's mean, right? So now I need to be able to do that all at once and twice that fast, right? Uh, so we're going to do it one at a time at the full tempo, which will sound like this. Um, and again i don't care too much about accuracy i do a little but i'm more about uh getting that getting all the way through all four notes quickly correctly and in my ear Let's see if we can do two. Oof. And you get you get worn out doing this kind of stuff too, right? Because it's it's physically taxing to play the line and with all these jumps in it, right? There's almost always a near octave jump at the end of every four notes. So um, it's like a seventh or an octave. And that can be, that can be really tire, tiresome, especially when you're going this fast. But it needs to go this fast. So be careful when you do stuff like this. Take, your, take rest like I'm taking right now in between times. Now we're going to go, this is our, and my brain runs out of buffer room about four or five in. And that's what gets me. So I'm going to try to do all of them a little bit under tempo and without a metronome so I can goose it a little on one side or another. And we'll see if we can do. I know I wasn't on pitch and I, I whistled instead of sang, but <clears throat> I saved my voice somehow. So here we go. Yeah, that's not bad. And so we now play the metronome game. We're not that far behind. We're maybe 20. So I'd go back 20 and just I'd rest a lot and sing it every other time at least. And maybe sing it every time and play it every time, right? And just go up by two or three or four beats per minute each trial. So anyway, that's that's some Boza. Uh That's enough of that for now. So I've now spent way too much time on two etudes, but we'll put 15 down. We didn't mark Hoffman because we're about half an hour in. And um, the Sclazy, I don't know. I don't know what this, the, no, it's, oh, that's not, uh, it's not the Sclazy that is the other four uh, unaccompanied piece. Um, I, if, I, if I take a longer break, I'll go get it, but you'll probably won't be here by then. But um, all right, so that was all we're going to do there as well. We'll put that down. Uh, okay, so now let's try, uh, we're going to do a little bit of, uh, well, we may as well switch to, let's, let's switch to uh, E-flat trumpet, but we're going to do a little bit of a sound exercise first uh, to get into the E-flat trumpet. Oh, yeah, happy, hey, uh, hi, Dad, happy Friday. This is a good, this is a good uh, Friday routine, right? Practice all my students' materials for the next week. I don't know. Did you ever do that? Did you, did you ever, I mean, you must've had to practice some of the stuff that some of your students were doing. Um, but when did you do it is the question. I think, I feel like if, if I was in a traditional, like in-person lesson setting, then I would normally practice whatever I just assigned them right after I assigned it. Right. If I had like a 10 or 15 minute break, I could just go right away and just like immediately start practicing that. Uh, and then maybe like touch it up over the weekend or something. Um, and I used to do that uh, when I taught at Syracuse, but I, I for, I would, for, it's something really complicated, like what I just was doing on the Boza. I would forget that a week later and I would have to, so like I need a refresher. So I guess you could do it right before their lesson, but then, I don't know. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a good solution except just practice all, all day, all the time. So anyway, we're going to try... Um, we're going to try to make this the E flat trumpet sound like the C trumpet 
And we're just going to play a real simple uh, exercise of just, we're going we're gonna to play an excerpt, right? We're going to play pictures at an exhibition. Everybody knows that one. It's not too hard of an excerpt. And, uh, and it's something that I can play on both trumpets, which is important, right? It can't be too low or I can't play it on the E flat. And it can't be so high that, you know, I'm struggling on the C trumpet to try to, to, try to do it. So, so we're just going to play a couple of notes of it too. We're not going to play the whole thing, but we might try different parts. And we're just going to, as quickly as we can, we're going to switch horns, you know, not, not a rush or anything, and just try to make the E flat sound like the C. What you don't want to do is the opposite, where you, you let the C trumpet drift towards the E flat and get kind of nasally. Um, and, and what we really want is to convince ourselves that the way that I play these two trumpets, even though they're, they have a different reflection point and they play a little bit differently, that the, the, my approach is, this, is working the same way in that horn. And I want to instantly be calibrated to the, this, the other horn, whichever one I'm switching to, right? So that's what we're looking for is if you, if you sound good on the C trumpet, then when you pick up the E flat, you try to do the same things. It's going to give you a slightly different result, but then you adjust your, uh, what you're doing to get the same result. And then you switch back and forth in order to be able to just pick it up and, and the result comes out and you somehow you all automatically know how to switch and, and not up here, but just your body knows, knows what it is. So, hi. Right? Pretty good. Close. Let's try a different part of it. high Fs. <clears throat> Try it again. So we've got sort of a, a good blow for, for this horn now. I'm, I'm overdoing a little bit because this is sort of a bombastic excerpt, right? But so when we play now the uh, Haydn and the Neruda, I will have a good production setup to go from, from. And if I want to sculpt that a little bit and make it a little bit more efficient, then I can, right? So, yeah, I'm glad you like it. Pictures is, is a great, uh, it's, it's uh, just a, an amazing piece uh, for the orchestra. And since, since my dad is here and I haven't started my timer yet, um, I'll tell this story that uh, <laughs> I, uh, so my dad played this with trumpet and organ. This was one of his, first really big albums that I grew up hearing him do as concerts. And so I, you know, I heard, I don't know even how many times, at least 25, 30 times when I was real young, uh, I heard him do this, the whole, all of pictures in an exhibition with different trumpets and with organ. And so when I finally heard it, I don't know, on the radio, or I, th I think I was probably already in high school or, or college by this point, um, I heard the, the Ravel orchestration. It's of course a Mussorgsky piano piece. But I heard the Ravel orchestration, which is what everybody knows. And I said to a friend of mine, I turn and I go, oh, that's nice. There's an orchestra version of this. Because I had never heard the orchestra version. I'd only ever heard my dad play it with organ. And I thought it was a solo trumpet piece. And, you know, organ and, organ and trumpet duo, I mean. And I'm sure I'd heard, like, him listening to the orchestration and, you know, researching. But I just, it didn't, never clicked. That, so I was thrilled that there was an or, or orchestra version. And I thought, wow, I hope I get to hear that someday live. And then, of course, I learned later that there's a piano version, which is really the original. And so then I'm like, oh, well, I'm really dumb now because I didn't know about the original. That, And then, of course, you don't like it because you're like, well, but I, that's not the one I like. That's not, that's not what I know. But you just have to listen to it more. And eventually you go, oh, that, that's just, they're all cool. I like them all. Right. So um, 
anyway, there's a lot of Ravel orchestrations of things that uh, had a really interesting piano version, but that he really brought to life in the orchestra. And so you should learn them both. Anyway, so there's my, there's my story about how I don't know anything about certain, certain things. Uh, assumptions are dangerous is the lesson there. So, uh, all right, we're going to play. First, we're going to play Neruda. And specifically, oh, uh, if you want to know, this is my favorite version of the Neruda. It's the uh, Ed Tarr. Uh, 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 is, is it Ed Tarr, actually? Yeah, Ed Tarr edition. Um, and it's, it's nice because it has all the correct notes in it. And um, it doesn't make any assumptions about uh, it doesn't make any editorial markings about slurs or tonguing that weren't in the original. And it comes with a facsimile. And I think I did this in other stream too. So here we go. We're going to work a little bit. Uh, yeah, I went over the hard spots. That's, that's what we're doing, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> so what are the hard spots? in the Neruda. Well, uh, the student that I am working on this with, uh, we're just, we're really just talking a lot about making sure that it's metronomically just absolute, right? That there's nothing, there's, we're not, we're not, you know, uh, unsure about the way that anything sounds. And so when you're working on time, one of the things you want to think about is how are you, like, how do you know that the time is good, right? You, anybody can put a metronome on, right? And I can just say, all right, yeah, I'm going to play the Largo, let's say. That's not too bad of a Largo. 64, let's say. So, but I can put the metronome on and I can play with it, right? But how do I know that when I turn the metronome off, I still have it? And the answer is, well, I have to know what the sound is over the beat, right? Not just what the sound is, like, in order but the sound of the rhythm. And I know that sounds like, well, of course, Gabriel, like that's how it works. But no, it, it's a thing that, it's a, it's a step we skip a lot because we go, oh yeah, I know how to play a triplet, you know? So you might play. Well, that was totally out of time, but if I do, if I do beat by beat in my head, I played a triplet, I played a longer note, I played an eighth note for one beat. I played a trill that I stopped counting during, and I moved on. And so, and that's the that's the way our brain works a lot of times. Where we're if we're looking note by note or beat by beat, then we're not really thinking about the sound of the rhythm over the over the beats, right? So instead, what we have to do <clears throat> is work on that by marking in any beats that are scary, like right here at the beginning of the second movement. There's two beats in this quarter note. And I need to make sure I count both of them, right? So, and you really want to make the triplets fill out the beat as much as possible so that they really don't sound like uh, some other you know, duplet type rhythm, right? Like, da, 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 da. you don't want that, right? Da, 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 da. And you notice I sing, I, I, even in the, I, I, I'm the worst singer in the world. It's saving my lip and it's giving me the opportunity to make sure that I really know what the sounds are over the beat in, in time, in pitch, everything. So now when I play it, I'm going to have way more, rhythmic confidence, right? So I don't, I'm not going to put the metronome on. I'm, I'm the metronome now because I've learned it, right? skipped a note there, but um, now, now we're really able to be expressive because we're playing over the beats in time. If you, if you have to play with the time or with the dynamics to be expressive, then, you know, 
that's those are limited tools, especially when you're supposed to play in time. That takes a whole tool away, right? You can always play louder and softer, but it's nice to have color at, uh, in, in your tool belt as well as dynamics, as well as maybe a little bit of dramatic timing in the sense that you're playing over time, but you might hold somewhere a little bit longer and then make sure the next beat comes in on time, right? You can only do that if you know the sound over the beats. So that's really what I wanted to get done here. Um, <clears throat> we've done lots of the second and the third movements on stream, so I'm going to do some of the first movement. <clears throat> and the same thing goes here, right? We can't slow down just because it gets harder. The um, I think if, if, you're, if you're working on this piece, uh, I think that these slurs, or sorry, these trills should probably almost, almost always come from above because of when the piece is from, right? It's pre-1800. It's about 18, uh, sorry, 1780, I think. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, it's early, right, compared to the Haydn. Uh, it's like 20 years earlier almost. So it's got to be before 1780 then. 1760 something maybe? I don't know. Now I need to, now I need to look it up. Um, yeah, it can't be 1780 because he died in 1780. That's where that number comes from. So anyway, um, but it's, it's too close to the Baroque era. And uh, the, the uh, sources that we have for uh, trilling from, from the note don't come until post-1800. Post um, and so I think that we're still in a world that you slur from, or start from above on most of them. And I've had to reprogram my brain for that a couple of times. So I'm just going to play a little bit of this. Just make sure. In fact, we don't need to start at the beginning. We can start at where it really starts getting hard in the in the second part, right? minor section um so yeah just making sure you're really in time and it gives you confidence right you feel like you can breathe you feel like you know when you're coming in it's just a lot better physically to try to do it in time than if you're than if you're playing beat by beat so and and how do you do it well you play phrase by phrase more or less right you I, i'm looking at a bigger chunk on the page and just playing the sound of all of that together instead of trying to read each note okay so that's kind of how that goes, I think. Uh, that's that's enough, probably, Neruda. We ran out of time about a minute and a half ago, but we'll call that six minutes. It was close enough. So now we're going to do the same thing to Haydn because it needs the same things because it's a very sort of similar piece, right? Um, and this is, if you, if you don't, this is my favorite edition of the Haydn. Uh, this is not an Ed Tarr one. Uh, this is G. Henley Verlag, uh, which just means edition. G. G. Henley is... Uh, the, the, the company name Henley is probably a guy's last name that started it a million years ago. But uh, this one is uh, Sonia Gar Gerlach um, and also just really excellent um, markings. Uh, nothing, nothing is added that they don't say we added this with little brackets. That way you can really try to understand the original. Um, and it's also just really easy to read on the page. The page is very clean looking, right? So, I don't know. I like it. And uh, let's let's work a little bit on the same types of movements, right? We'll do the second, maybe, and the third. Yeah, that sounds good. Probably won't take all six minutes on this because we basically just covered it. But um, we want the same like rhythm. Make sure that I know the sound of the piece over time, right? So. I'm going to put it on eighth notes. Oh, that's too fast. Well, that's really too fast. Let's try 80. 80 sounds good, right? 
Uh, unfortunately, my voice was right that time. Da, da. You should sing in the right register. My dad also always told me this, and I couldn't do it for a lot of years, but it, your tongue position is much, much closer to where it needs to be if you sing in the right register. So I'll try. Da, even if you have to go into falsetto. Da, 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 da. Right, so I'm I'm making sure that every beat is an event for me, right? If it's tied over, right? That that way I don't rush through long notes. I don't rush through ties. I'm I have a every every single thing has an event that's tied to it. And I don't need to make that big swell. I just need to feel that in my, in my sort of subconscious uh, or rather conscious. Um, and then the other thing is what, you know, think about what, what do you have to subdivide here, right? It's not eighth notes because most of the notes are eighth notes. Uh, eighth notes and quarter notes, sure, you know, you could get away with it, but the very first rhythm you have is a 16th note subdivision, right? Is Right? That's the subdivision. So you've got to be thinking that way uh, from the very beginning. And then you can sort of shift if you want for a little while and think just eighth notes. But as soon as you get close to those 16th notes, you better be subdividing them. And then 32nd notes are on their way, right? Um, I have to be going. Uh, I, this is a this is a good Mike Sachs trick that he taught me uh, taught all of us at uh, oh 2002 Denver ITG excerpt class uh, that he did, which was amazing. I never forgot it. He did FETs and he does all the subdivisions for what's coming up next. So that's what you have to think about. Is like I can't start subdividing on the subdivision. I need to subdivide the note before it in that new subdivision, right? So I'll do that. Let's see. So you're always thinking about that new subdivision. And then, of course, it's, it's undaunting. This is a movement you can play a little bit with the time and get away with it, but, but you don't need to. If you go the right speed, I'm going very slow, but if you go the right speed and it sort of just carries itself and you can be expressive in other ways. So that's the second movement. Uh, now let's just worry about everybody wants to know about the hard lick in the third movement, right? And if you look up... I don't know where my music dictionary is. It's way over here. If you look up what this symbol is, it's a it's a double mordant. And mordants go down, not up, first of all. It's in the back of the Christine Ammer book. Oh, mine has <laughs> mine has a, a, a sticky on it, but I don't need any more. So Christine Ammer book, and it's in the back. It's the last page that has real anything on it. And if you look here, Okay, what we're looking at is for sure at least a mordant. Let's see if I can get that. I don't know if you can see that on the stream, but it's for sure at least a mordant, and it really looks a lot more like the double mordant, right? And again, that could be an addition thing that, like, maybe it's not clear in the manuscript, and so they put the double. But what a double mordant is, is downward. So trills always go up, and mordants always go down. And they, the trill... And the mordant look the same, except the mordant always has a, 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 a slash, like a vertical line through it. Uh, and the trill is just the wiggly part, which makes sense. So, but a double mordant is, that's a double mordant. Now you try fitting in, you know, to, I mean, it's really, it's really bad. And that would be, you know, that would be, 
right, that would be a slow tempo for this, and I, there's no way. So I think it's probably a single mordant, but I do try to go down instead of up. Uh, it's okay if you do go up. A lot of recordings do, and um, you know it makes sense. And I, I mean, again, I'm I'm happy to be proven wrong on this, but that's the best of my knowledge. Um, so I do it this way. Again, this is a complicated lick. It's not. It's not. A, it's not an effect. Oh, we hit it. I let the timer go that time. Um, it's not a complicated effect that is going to take me time, but I need to know what it's going to sound like, right? If I just if I just say and then I trill or and then I mordant, I guess, then I wiggle this finger, it's going to be out of time. It's going to take too long. I'm not. I don't know when to play the C, right? So I need to make an exact sound that I can hear in my head. So for me, it's just one down, right? It's one mordant. It's Da, 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 and it's two sixteenth or two thirty second notes in a sixteenth note, right? So it's not it's exactly right. It's exactly that every time. And then when I speed it up, I know when it's gonna happen and I can handle that. So that's what we do. That's all you do. Uh, and then if, you're, if your copy, just so we're covering it, the next lick, if your copy has grace notes here, this is, again, early enough that the grace notes are, uh, they're taking half the value of the note that they precede, and you play them on the downbeat. And this is because you're not allowed to have, uh, the, you're not supposed to write dissonances on downbeat. So if it's any kind of suspension sound, if it's any kind of dissonance from the chord that's underneath it, then you had to write it as a grace note and that, that's just what we did, right? So um, uh, you could play it as grace notes because they were grace notes. And I think my dad has done that actually, but uh, just to hear what it sounds like, right? But, but um, anyway, it goes. Right? Just all 16th notes, basically. So there you go. Oh, hi. Uh, probably Eric, I would imagine. Yeah, if you... I was talking to you earlier. If you did want to join, I have a thing I want to try that's with this new software. So if you're still here uh, and you want to try it, then let me know. And you can just ask me live questions or you can play some if you want. So anyway, that's the Haydn. Uh, we don't need to do much more of that for now. Um, what are we going to do next? We're going to call that six minutes because it was rough, roughly six. Uh, I have at the beach question mark here. Um, Let's see what else we're going to do. Bame Concerto, that's B flat as well, and Charlie A10 and 14. So, yeah, why not? That's not very many things. Let's try to find at the beach. Uh, okay, so let me put this away first. We're going to get that out in a second. Um, right. So, at the beach. Where are you? I mostly have these organized by students. Aha, at the beaches in inside there. Good. So um, at the beach is a tough piece, um, but really more because you never stop playing than that any given spot is really hard. Um, oh, we did the Naruto already. Yeah, putting things in the wrong places already. So um, <clears throat> if you don't know this piece, it's basically the last, the, 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 the latest, the last uh, written true cornet solo. It's Virgil Thompson. Uh, this is written in um, right around 1950, I believe. 50. This one says uh, copyright 63. So um, yeah, I think it was late 50s or even, or even as late as 63 as possible. And um, <clears throat> it's it's hard because you never stop playing. That's what's hard about this one. And I'm going to play it on a on a trumpet because it does say solo trumpet at the top. Uh, just because it's a cornet type style piece, um, we play these on trumpet all the time now. And it's not wrong to play them on cornet if if it's a cornet solo you want to play. Uh, but you most people are they have sort of a um, a strong opinion about whether or not you should play it on a cornet or a trumpet based on what it is. 
but they, they don't seem to care at all about whether or not you're playing it on a, 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 an instrument that it really was written for. In other words, you know, they might play a modern cornet and say, well, this is the right instrument because it's a cornet solo. I would say that that instrument has about as much to do with the original cornet that it would have been played on uh, for most of our solos, especially the ones written in the 1800s. Uh, it has about as much to do with that instrument as the trumpet does. <laughs> so uh, I think it's okay to play these on trumpet. Uh, it's great if you want to play them on cornet too. It's a, it's a different sound. It's a beautiful instrument. Um, and I can show you, maybe that'll be a fun thing to do with At the Beach. I can go get uh, uh, the, the sort of a, a, approximately period instrument. I, I, don't, I don't think I can do 1960, but I can do like 1940. Uh, so that's closer anyway. <clears throat> but we'll see. Uh, what, what, what we want to do now is just get some of these. There's a lot of sort of, I don't know, um, tricky, tricky licks in this piece. And uh, we might try the end. I don't know. See what my high G chops feel like today. But uh, but the big thing about Virgil, this this uh, piece, this at the beach, is it's extremely extremely lyrical. So you cannot just play the notes, right? That's absolutely not going to work. Uh, it just sounds bad then. So <clears throat> let's give it a shot. Let's see if I can get this guy going. Yeah. Oh, you know, I actually can. My old recording cornet is probably approximately 1960. I don't know how well it works right now. I don't even know where it works right now. I think it's in the other room somewhere. Yeah, maybe we can try that. <clears throat> I, I don't have a mouthpiece for it. I don't, the old receivers are bigger. And so I have to just jam a mouthpiece down the whole thing. And it doesn't, I might be, I can play a couple of bars. At least you get a sense of it. So the first nasty licks are these opening things. Uh, you have to be ready for the for the for the sort of shift, um, and but you can't you can't force it out. So, uh, and I'm also going to change. I'll, I'll have real nice fast vibrato like Hokan Hardenberg or somebody to try to get that going. can't go too slowly on that poco retard it's poco right a lot of people want to play in like a, a bar each quarter note in the old tempo and that's way way too that's a molto retard right um yeah otherwise you 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 want to kind of keep it going there's a lot of fermatas and if you take all of the time in the world and each one of them then you know your audience is going to go like well, is he going to play the piece or what like 18 times in the first page so uh, you want to be careful about that too. I took a little too much time in the second section. The beginning, you can take a lot of time because people are interested in what you're going to play. But halfway down the page, you want to kind of keep it going, right? So this part, so, so de voce, we need to change the sound, right? Oh. just kind of it never stops and this is the problem with this piece you just feel tired if you're going to do it at the end of your recital which is a good 
it's a nice piece at the end. Uh, you, you better really have chops of steel, um, but not of sheet metal steel, right? Because you'll, you'll just airball this whole piece. There's too many, there's too many just sort of lyrical passages that never stop. And, uh, and I'm stopping now because I'm, I can't play any more of this page right away. I'm going to have to, uh, just take a short rest here and, and move on. Uh, I'll play what I actually really wanted to work on, which is instead of just show, showcasing the piece, uh, I never, I never really look at these little arpeggiations on the third page. So that's what I need to, you know, all right, and I should I should mark them in while I go. So this is D major, D. This is G. This is D. Uh, this is A. Ooh. A major. D again. G again. Right. So I'm just marking in the type of arpeggio it is. So there's C. Right. Oh, that one is a B minor. Yeah, interesting. Put a minor on there. And I know this isn't the best television or anything, but B minor again. But if it, it, as far as me being a good steward of the type of practice I want to do, or what I want my students to do, um, you, know, you, you, you stop and you mark it in. You, you take that rest, right? <clears throat> now, I don't really have to think I need to, the, the first note. And I know that all of them are, are straight arpeggios, no sevens, just, just triads. But they don't start on the roots necessarily, right? And that's okay. Uh, so. Oh, I screwed it up. <laughs> I, I wrote C because I didn't look at the key signature. So it's C sharp minor. Is No, it's not either. C sharp diminished. Yeah. C sharp diminished. Okay. Now, if you don't know your arpeggios, that won't help you, right? And in fact, that one's not helping me very much right now because it's not fully diminished. Right? It's not a seven chord, so I'm I have to remember that tritone at the beginning. But uh, that was the timer, so. So now that's a lot easier for me to do because I've sat, I sat down and marked it all out. Right. And, um, that, that I tried to play it even when I was repeating it, I want to play it with the correct style because if I don't, if I'm just, I, there are plenty of reasons to play longer notes, let's say, or, or, uh, slower or whatever. But once you're actually going to play it at tempo, you want the style to be the only way you know how to play it that way that's what comes out when you are under pressure and not some other thing that you've also practiced. So um, I'm not going to play the ending and, and beat up my chops too bad uh, over and over or try to get it, but I do want to sort of say something about it. Well, actually, there's two things I want to say. One is I've never heard anybody play the Ossia measure uh, underneath, and I've always wanted to hear that, right? So maybe we can hear that today. Um, but the other thing I'll say is uh, it doesn't say to stop time while you get ready for the high G, which is what everybody does, including me. I have to do it. But one day I'd like to be able to go, bum, 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 because that's what it says to do, right? It's one beat where you land on a G, and the next beat is a high G half note with a fermata, and then the, the piano plays blump, blump at the end, right? I think it's two blumps. Maybe it's just blump. But... Um, I've always wanted to be able to do that and I can do it in one, in like a one off, but I can't do it after the whole piece. It's just too much, too much crush. So let's play, let's play a little bit. Let's see here. Uh, I'll play where everybody knows where it starts and then I'll play the Aussie one. I'll see if I can sight read that. Oh yeah, it's interesting. Okay. So. A 
lot different than what you might remember if you've ever heard this piece, right? It's really not bad. I like it. And on the third, major third, you can omit that from the piano part so you can play it a little bit more in tune. Uh, I'll, now I'll play, I guess, the real one. But this, yeah, isn't this lick interesting? This... You don't get to hear, it's probably in the piano, but I think it's an interesting, interesting lick. Anyway, uh, let's see, the ending that's the, re the original, the regular, is... Like I said, I can do it like that one in one off, but it's not my best high G to try to just get it after all this other stuff. Um, that wasn't my best high G either, but you know, whatever. That's that's enough, as I say, of at the beach. Uh, okay, so what are we going to do next? Spain concerto. Well, this should be uh, mean enough. So uh, the the part of the Bame concerto we're going to do today. Um, we're going to do two parts. We're going to do what I like to, I, I affectionately call the Mario section. And if you're my student who's working on this right now, you know exactly, you've heard me say that and you know exactly what I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm working off the trumpet in A part that's from, um, from IMSLP because I, I believe this to be fairly close to the original, um, even though there are some errors in it. Uh, but we usually play it up a half step now. We play the BAME in F minor instead of E minor. And so I can just read the same notes and play B flat trumpet and it works. Um, I, I've played this piece once and I played it on four valve E flat trumpet because my dad gave me a part that was already pre-transposed and I didn't have to worry about it. And I have I could play low enough, right? You can't play a, a low A on B flat trumpet part on an E flat trumpet because it would be a low E, right? But on a four valve, you can. You set the set the fourth valve like on a piccolo, right? You can play low E on a, on a four valve instrument. So you could sort of, oh hey Jay, um, you can sort of you know play those low notes. Uh, but you really got this whole section. Then you have to work so hard on these weird fingerings and you know getting around it. So I don't know that it's worth playing on an E flat trumpet unless you really had to because you know the uh, the, the the recital that you were playing was too hard otherwise. Uh, it does make it easier, except for this part, uh, and it makes the trill a lot easier. That's that everybody everybody does the lip trill here um, on A, uh, high A, <clears throat> and you sort of do have to do that. Unless uh, I was telling my student, like I can, I've worked out so that I can play a valve trill on G to A, right? Which people say you can't do uh, because it's always a lip trill, right? The And that comes up like in the Hummel, if you play it on B flat trumpet, all kinds of places. But actually you can, if you... I can just, if you get your tongue position and your air support and your lip just exactly right, you can make it so that it's only A and G. I only got it for like the second half of that, but I can't quite do it on... on I can't do it on A to B yet. So you'll have to give me some more time. I got to get stronger or something. I don't know what yet. Uh, just get that coordination worked out. And I'll, I'll, one day I'll be able to do a valve trill on A and B, but it won't be today. So, uh, and it is B natural, by the way. I know that B, B flat is in the key signature here if you're following along at home, but it is in fact B natural because uh, the whole section is sort of in this D uh, major or G major or something sound, right? something, some sharp major, so it's going to be B naturals, and that they're more, mostly marked in anyway. Uh, so, let's get the first note right. Now let's set the timer first, six minutes on the clock. Let's say five, because I talked too long. I have a bad habit of starting too open in the low register, and then I, I'm not set up right, so I'm, I'm making a conscious effort not to drop my jaw as much but <clears throat> that means I have to cheat and sort of play a scale or something. 
but then that's that's good for me, right? If you have these kinds of problems where it's like, oh, you know, every time I start playing, I can't get those low notes. Well, then don't start there, you know, because you're just gonna hurt. You're you're just gonna do more damage to your better habits, right? So. <laughs> something that's a little more focused than just blah, right? <clears throat> then that's that's going to help you memorize that spot better so that tomorrow it's a little easier for you to get there. So huh. I can't promise I'll get that all day, but... So this is a spot I have to work on. If I'm going to go that fast, which is a good tempo, then... Right? So... It's the A I'm not hearing. I think I should not pull out either. I'm pulling out with my with for the C sharp here. I should pull out on the other side. Oh, that's so much nicer, right? So much more clean and in tune. So, all right. So this, this part, you have to figure out where you're going to breathe. You can always breathe a little bit after the last eighth note, but very little bit. Otherwise, you'll come in late. So some people have to do it every one. I don't recommend it because then you're, you're might, you might be resetting your embouchure a little bit, getting a little bit spread. You're also st maybe stacking breaths, um, although usually we're kind of out, so there's not much to stack. But it's just it's the same as the Haydn. If you breathe every chance you get, then you just kind of get caught up. Your air feels stuck and you can't get it out. You can't really support well. So it's better to breathe as little as possible, but really choose where you are going to breathe. And that's what we need to figure out here. So, um, and we, we, this is one of those things where I can choose a spot based on the music, uh, but it may not be a spot that I really can breathe or should breathe. Uh, I might need to breathe somewhere else. And so that I, this is one of the few things that you can't do just by singing and doing the fingerings and thinking through it. You got to play it, right? And you got to play it at tempo. So you have to have that worked out first. But that's what we're going to figure out. So uh, let's see. So we're going to breathe for sure after the, after the low D. Um, it's not great, but it's the only place we've got, right? So we'll, we'll do. Huh. So we've already breathed once. So that's good. Uh, and that makes sense because there's a quarter note there that we can cut. And that's our last breath. So now we know we can start there. That's good. Ooh, so I can make it the whole way through. That might be one plan. I'm going to I'm going to put a for sure breath at the end after the F sharp. Da, 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 so that I can change character anyway, right? That'll help me do that. And we need an emergency breath, <laughs> someplace that I know I can breathe. Um, that if I if I want to. Oh, we have another minute because they said it for a minute less. Um, but right, we're only gonna get one section. Well, I uh, I'm only at, uh, 20 minutes into the second section. We only have two more things to do, so we should be fine. Famous last words, right? But uh, let's try it again. Maybe 
maybe I should breathe right before the piano part to help to help sort of lift and reset. I don't need a breath there. I've only played three things, but if I do breathe there, and this may be a dangerous breath, so we may take this one back out, but. That's too dangerous. Not going to do it. Good, good plan. Uh, bad execution, right? I got this, by the way, I'm using a mechanical pencil. Uh, I know, gasp. But um, the, I, I found some new, this will be a fun thing to do for a second. I found some new graphite for mechanical pencil 0 0.5, 0 0 0.05, uh, yeah, 0.5 millimeter, right? And this stuff is amazing. Pilot Neox graphite. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, at B grade and not HB. And it doesn't shine from the lights in your on your music, so it's like it's like completely matte black. It does uh, smudge pretty easily, but I'll take it. You know, if it means that I can see the markings that I made, no matter what angle my stand is, that's amazing. Because most most graphite is shiny at some angle, and so you you know you can't see those markings as easily, or you just can't see that part of the you know music. Anyway, <clears throat> okay, so we've taken that breath mark out. I think we're just going to have to practice making it the whole way. And if I play softer, that'll be easier, right? So that's one section we wanted to work on, um, and and we worked out pretty well on that. We've got we've got the things. This is another one where I could mark out the arpeggiations if I was unsure, like I did in the uh, at the beach. Uh, I don't need to because the, they're they're a little more obvious to me in this setting. But um, okay, where is the other spot I wanted to work on? Ah, yes. Okay, the rondo, right? The the sort of ending section. So this can be really tricky because there's all these little rhythms, uh, grace notes, uh, complicated technical passages, right? Um, and it is, it, th th there's a lot to work on here. You gotta go slow, you gotta make sure that you're hearing everything. But this, the reason I wanted to do it is because it's kind of a culmination of the things that we worked on in the Haydn and the Neruda and some other places where, yeah, these things, they're, they're ornamental or they're, you know, uh, if it's a trill, if it's a grace note, whatever, right? But whatever it is, I need to know the sound of it. And that's the big theme today for this class uh, has been just like, I need to know what it sounds like to play that. And before I try to play it, right? So in other words, th th this this very first, uh, or rather, for example, this very first thing, right? But um. I can't, I can't guess about, you know, the time has already started. And a lot of people will just skip the grace notes, but that's not okay either. You can't just skip notes that the composer wrote, right? They're just little blips before. So you just have to imagine them and you have to know what that should sound like, right? So I'm here to tell you. That might be a little fast. Let's see what 80 actually is. That was pretty much right on. So you yeah, you can when you learn this, you gotta go as slow as you need, but that's what you're you're gearing up for. So let's try playing it. Not bad. Uh, and it's, it's traditional to slow down a little at those fermatas a little bit. Don't don't make a big deal out of it. And, and remember, when you're off the fermata, you're right in time on the next thing. So just enough time to get a breath and then right back in. It's not a fermata of rest. It's not... No, it's... 
That's the next one we're going to do. Oh, that's bad. Oh, terrible singing. Sorry again. So I'm going to I'm going to take those apart. I'm going to be a better practicer than that. There's going to be a lot of that, I think, in this one. Yeah, I got to get the articulation right when you're going slow. Otherwise, you won't get it when you go fast. So... I did it again. Oof. Again, remember, you got to know what it sounds like before you try to play it. Otherwise, you're going to guess when you try to play it in your lip and your air and everything's not going to work right. So if you but if you do know it, what it sounds like over the beats and in more than a beat at a time, like a measure or four measures at a time, then your air can do the work all the way through. And that's what we're looking for here. right um let's see if we have anything new to do that's the same uh this <laughs> this is not a great one i would do definitely a, a a third valve trill there if you can i i often get caught doing one and two trills because i'm gripping the horn for the the hard lick that's coming up so this is just a arvin's lick right it's just a one five one or one five seven one uh and we do these a lot but if you don't then or you haven't yet then it's going to take some time right go go look in the arbens book though uh so I'll, i'm probably going to do one and two trill unfortunately <laughs> Oh boy, that's this one I didn't look at. Oh, it's really it's it's weird on B flat to me. And then we've got F major. C major. Oops, this one's cut off. I just happen to know. It's a C. So it's C major again, and then it's uh, w w uh, G7 with an A on top. So that's fine. We'll we'll play it by ear, as it were. All right, here we go. I'll try the third valve trill, see if that works for me. can't see it we're gonna to have to memorize it so that's the whole lick now we'll rest for a second and i'm gonna play that one lick again too is cut off for me and then i have music again um yeah i mean that's that's kind of how you work on it right you go slow enough to get it but you really have to see big picture if you read note by note you're never gonna make it so all right we got a half hour left let's hit at least one of these uh i don't know how much time that was now i haven't been writing down my times so i guess i don't get to i get i don't get to know um but 
Okay, that's Bame. Or uh, Bame is really pronounced Brima, but nobody says that, and it sounds real pretentious. So what I like to tell my students uh, is you should know the correct pronunciation of people like Brima and uh, Berlio. No Z. It's there, but you don't say it. But don't correct people. Don't, you should know because you're a scholar and a studied person who cares about, you know, knowing what the correct thing is. But uh, there's also there's also the part of uh, of speech where names are funny because they're one of the only things that we say. We try to we try to say the same way even if we speak a different language. Whereas uh, other words, we, you're you're supposed to say them at least most people agree, you're supposed to say them in your own language, the way that you would say them. And I wish I could come up with, um, like you, uh, chicharron is a good one. Or, uh, oh gosh, um, I don't know. I mean, any, any, any word that you would say differently, like if you, if you had to put on an accent to say it quote unquote correctly, don't do that. It's probably offensive. Instead, you want to say it the way that you would say that word in in your American English. And we understand that it's a word from another country that you're saying in an English, uh, American English accent. And so then we understand what the word is. Um, if you speak that language and you can say it perfectly, then that's not offensive at all. That's great. But um, but yeah, you have to be careful about stuff like that. Or at least you don't have to, but you I think you should. So argue with me in the comments if you want. Um, all right, <clears throat> so we're going to play some Charlier's. We're going to do, I believe it's 10 and 14. And we're not going to play through all of them because there's no way after a couple hours of playing, I'm going to be playing multiple Charlier's in a row. But let's take a look at both of them together. And, um, oh, you know what? I forgot about number 14. I, I look for this etude every once in a while. I never would look here for it. It sounds more like a, a Soxa or... Oh, gosh, I don't know. Um, like from that old Chickowitz Flow Studies, uh, the etudes section where he sort of copied etudes from all of his favorite books. This might be in there, actually. Maybe, maybe that's where I know it from. Yeah, well, let's start with 14 then. Um, and the reason is we've already kind of covered some of this stuff in um, the, I guess, the Boza etudes, right, where we were changing the color in order to change the, the uh, sort of pull out one voice against the other uh, and play accompanimental stuff with ourselves. Oops, six minutes, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, we're gonna do some of that in here, but we're actually gonna do it with the tongue this time because it's accented every time. And uh, that's it's much easier to sort of play with one timbre, but then let our tongue make a little bit more brightness because it's had it. I normally don't want explosive tonguing from me or my students, but in this case, a little bit of that uh, makes it very easy to sort of get the right character. So uh, we're looking all the way down to the fourth from, fourth from the bottom line of the Charlier. And we have these really nice sort of uh, contrasty parts. This is kind of like uh, Petrushka or something, right? Now I'm I'm making a volume difference too. I shouldn't do that. big contrasts in this one. There's not really much else to it except make sure, make absolutely sure that you're playing the correct notes, that you're playing, that the, the, the accidentals carry through the whole bar, right? It's little mistakes like that that can make a big difference in uh, how, how it sounds and, and how easy it is to play. Um, there's not really much more to it than that. This whole one, you, you want to go as fast as you can go without 
totally folding, right? Uh, it says 76. Let's, that's not much less than where we were before. That's fast, man. That's, uh, I'll try a little bit of it this way. Yeah, some of the, the it's this stuff that's hard at this tempo, right? You go, um, right that's that's what's hard it's these, these bad fingerings i got it sort of but it's not very musical or clean or with a good sound yet um so i wouldn't do it at 76 to do that um i'll try a little bit of it about that tempo though let's go a little slower let's go 70. And now I'm just identifying, it's, this is another thing you can do. If you're impatient like most of us, uh, and certainly me, then you can just play through things at the end of your session. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't have anything else after this that I want to practice uh, today. And so I'm just going to play through some of my etudes. And I'll rest when I need to rest, right? I'm not in a hurry to get like the max endurance challenge part of this done, because that's not how you build endurance. You build endurance by knowing the piece better and playing it easier, right? So I'm... I'm just going to play through, uh, and if I screw up a part, uh, I might stop and work on it, or I might just remember, okay, tomorrow I'm going to work on that, and I'll build it up the, the right way, you know. But so now I'm kind of on a seek and destroy mission to find like where are the parts that uh, sound destroyed, and let me rebuild them later, right? So and, th and in this case, I do want to use a metronome, and I could do a singing phase. I could also just go slower to begin with and not ever ma make any mistakes. Uh, because I'm going so slow that I don't need to, right? And that's what I always advocate, but we are human beings and we are not perfect. And so, um, at least most of us, right? So uh, I'm certainly not. And I'm going to make mistakes. And one of them is that I want to rush through the process, right? But let's do that as healthily as possible, right? So if I'm going to play through it, I'm going to use a metronome. I'm going to mark the spots that don't go well for me. And I'm going to come back either later or right right away and work on them so that they, they're there, right? So we're going 70 instead of 76. I'd be okay with 70. Uh, it does also say dolce, which, if you don't know, means sweetly, right? It's like dolce, dolce de leche. Uh, again, in my bad American English, is uh, sweet, the sweet milk, like sweet cream, right? There's a new... Dolce de Leche uh, cinema, uh, uh, French Toast Crunch, I believe, out right now, if you're into cereal like I am. This is the spot. This whole line, really. I can do most of the wiggly parts, but... That's the, those three bars are really what's going to get me. Oh, and we're out of time. So that's a good place to end on that uh, etude. We got the we got the sort of pounded out part of the end, and uh, and we worked. We we identified a place we're going to need to work on tomorrow, and then everything else that I didn't play is pretty much a version of what I already have played. There's some low stuff that maybe will work out, but that's pretty good for an etude that you know uh, is it has this many notes and I don't have to work on it too many too many minutes more. Uh, and I I mean I know this etude already because it's in my syllabus, so I usually play about once a year, maybe twice or three times. Uh, but all at the same time, so still once a year. Um, and the same thing with this one. These are these are co-etudes on the same week because I'm a mean teacher. Uh, so here we go on, let's see, part two, six minutes as well. I would love if somebody would ask me some questions. That's always, I hate to beg for it, but 
That way I don't have to just play uh, constantly. So, okay, this is a very long etude. Number 10 is what we're on now, Charlier number 10. And um, this is one that people practice from top to bottom, left to right, and they fold hard because the hard part is the end. I mean, there's, there's, the whole thing is hard, but it's not the beginning. The beginning's pretty easy. The bottom of the first page is hard, and the entire second page seems hard. Let's put it that way. So, uh, I, there's also, I think somebody maybe cut out part of um, this etude, maybe for an audition or something, because there's like parentheses around a section, or maybe that's where they wanted to work. It's not my handwriting. But this book usually lives in my studio, and I believe that I permanently borrowed it from a former student who uh, ended up not playing a lot of trumpet after she graduated. So, so thank you to her for donating her uh, Charlet book so I didn't have to spend $55 on, on this one uh, or whatever it was at the time. I, I uh, very much appreciate it, and I'm happy to pay you for it if you ever want me to. Anyway. Um, so let's see if that that is certainly a section I want to work on. So let's try it. Well, that's the key signatures help. It's not terribly hard. I didn't play it great, but um, it's hard to. It's it's weird for me to start there instead of uh, four bars earlier because it doesn't sound right. So maybe we should start earlier. <clears throat> we can play through that. Uh, but what we what we're going to get to is another part that people mess up a lot, and that is these marcato eighth notes. Remember where the beats are. Again, the, the theme of today is like know what the what the sound of the piece is over the beats. If you don't have both, then you're not going to play the piece correctly, and it's also going to be harder to play. So here, what people do a lot is they'll speed up those eighth notes for some reason, but they're very precise. So if we're going to go, let's see, this says 92. I don't know if I've ever played at 92. Oof. But I always like to explore the tempos every time I get back to this. Okay, sure. So that means eighth notes are what? All right, that's how that goes. If you can't sing it, if you're if you're not familiar with it enough to to be able to do that, you need to get there before you even touch the trumpet, or at least you can touch the valves, right? Just to do the fingering. But um, there's that's rattling. So we can start right on that. Right? So that's that's one part solved and you don't it doesn't take a long time. It's not a very complicated section, but it's a section people mess up a lot because they really simply just haven't gotten there in their practice yet. They practiced too hard on the first page and never really looked at that very simple section and made sure that it was in time. Um, then the ending is pretty hard. It's Allegro now, which uh, he doesn't tell us how that would be different than 92, except that it does have a real value, and that value is like about 110, 120, right? So let's go 120, why not? Now, does that make it hard? Yeah, yeah, totally. But we want to figure out if we can do it. So now, now we've got, it says staccato ternier. Uh, that is triple tonguing essentially, right? It's, it's triplets and staccato and then staccato binaire, uh, which means the duple version, right? So probably double tonguing. Uh, I'm in a single tongue there. Um, I, I don't think it literally means to do the tonguing pattern, but that it's a triplet versus a duplet um, and that they're staccato, All right? So, but I'll definitely triple tongue the first parts. Oh boy. Oh boy, that's bad. 
So, eh, it took me too many tries at the beginning, but I, I, I didn't have my finger and my tongue aligned. That's what was going on, right? So I'd have to sl slow down. And again, just like last week, I need to choose, am I going to go, or I think I'm going to do the TTKs uh, on this one. So... And that's fine for single tonguing. Uh, as long as I don't go any faster, uh, it's fine. And then the last part, it says, um, en élargissant. Uh, again, see, I did it. I, en élargissant, right? That's what I should have done. And uh, that means to, uh, like, bigger, right? Enlarging um, is the same root word that we have in English. So... <laughs> slower right enlarging the, the beats uh okay so that's that's uh the, the last page and it, it, the timer went off but nobody asked any questions so i'll just i'll finish off this piece and we'll work on the other hard part so you might say well the beginning's not easy right and it's that's true but um the really the hard part for most people is that you've got triplets next to duplets all the way through this and uh, the, there's no harder part than when you start adding in ties uh, to over the downbeat, over the bar lines, right? It just gets really complicated. And again, your solution is know what it sounds like over the beats. Mark those beats in with a pencil and just go as slow as you have to without a metronome even where you're just going. Ba -da -ba 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 -da 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 right it's really the duple gets easier as you go faster but make sure you know you're you're doing the correct subdivision and that you're able to switch between duple and triple and you can even just walk down the street and you're going right just practicing subdivisions of beats right i used to do this with all my percussionist friends where we would we would try to get from you know duple triple quadruple quintuple sec, uh, 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 sextuple septuple all in the same you know i'll see if i can still do it if you use tabato numbers it actually works out pretty easily um let's see <clears throat> One, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two. And I sort of cheated a little bit on the seven. It's hard for me to say that it's one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's it, it's really hard to get the seven. And the seven has two syllables, so I'm never good at the sevens. But uh, anyway, that's, that's the exercise we used to do. And uh, it works really well. If you do it a lot, it... You, you get better at subdivisions. So anyway, um, let's, where are we going to start? Let's start uh, uh, about halfway down the page. You'll start seeing. Uh... Right. So one of the, one of the, tricky parts is knowing what the scale is that you have to play so you don't have to look at each note again, right? Again, seeing a bigger picture. So what is this? That's A major, right? So A major, it goes to, then you play a B chromatic scale for five notes, right? And then it's A major again, right? That's the way I see it anyway. And I have that marked out in my part. I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but oops, right on that scale, I have some markings, A major, and then a line indicating chromatic, and then 
just two carrots and a and a stick <clears throat> to mean whole, two whole steps and a half step. So we're going to start right after that, I guess, because that's fine. Lot of duple triple duple triple and you got to really know the whole the, how the whole bar sounds and play the whole bar together and on to the next bar and play the whole bar together otherwise you're stuck I, and I did it a little bit that time I got a little bit da, 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 da. and I, you want to accent those ands on the twos it's accent it's written that way right <clears throat> but uh, I could do a little better than that let's try again <clears throat> right on that section and don't don't forget so the first thing is uh, carry through accidentals, right? On this. The last two notes are B sharp and C sharp because C sharp's from the key signature and B sharp occurs earlier in the bar. So be careful there. And then that, that the note looks like a tie, an A tied to an A, but it's A slurred to an A sharp. It changes over the bar, and if your eyes don't move, you miss it every time, right? So you just don't look at it. Memorize it, and you'll never miss it. Uh, okay, here we go. Right on that lick. I keep messing up the fingerings there. I, I'm I'm always trying to move on to the the one below it. I think so. That's that's my eyes being too unspecific. I think. All right, I'll get I'll get in a better mental space here. hard to know when that stringendo should happen, right? <clears throat> the stringendo happens the last three beats there, but it's easier if you do it a little earlier, just a little bit, uh, because it's hard to make those duples go faster without just sounding like you're playing the wrong rhythm. But if you add one more beat, like the, the triplet gets a little faster, then it makes sense with the duples. Uh, and so that's what I do. But anyway, that's, that's what this one's all about. Um, you know, you play a little bit of the beginning, I guess. Um, just so you know which one it is, in case you were like, ah, I gotta find this one. It's number 10, but. on the little a but i mean that's all the etude is and if you know it well enough you can really just just breeze right through it says dolce here again um and even scherzando at some point so you don't want to go you don't want to go slow you want to kind of just breeze your way through it uh even gives you uh 60 beats to the dotted half note which i think i'm probably approximately doing huh. you can't do okay, that's not going to help that's that's the dotted quarter. So, so it's going maybe a little fast, I think. But anyway, so that's that's another uh, uh, sort of practicing Friday masterclass. Uh, there's a couple of you here, so thank you for sticking around. 
Um, I don't have any, uh, uh, any, anything else really to say, except uh, I hope that some more people will come next week to, pre uh, to play. Uh, now that I have this new dual cast system, uh, I think I may get the paid version so I can have a little more facility in there. Um, but I can already invite people to join me, and I'm not sure what that means, uh, except that maybe they open their browser and it works the same as it works for me. So I would love to try that out with somebody <laughs> at some point um, and just see what that, what that button does so that I can see if that's going to work. And maybe we'll have some guests on here. I'm doing master classes for a couple of other schools, and so I may... Um, as sort of uh, exchange with, with those teachers, I may ask them to come on this stream and, uh, and uh, help my students on it, but also just so that everybody can see that, uh, if they're cool with it, if they don't mind being public and free, um, because none of us have any money right now. But So yeah, so please email me if you want to play on this. I would love for you to, and uh, it will save me from playing my face off for two hours or three like we did last week. So, but anyway, thanks everybody for coming, and um, I hope my students, if, you, if you're not sure if you're playing those two Charliers and you're one of my students watching or watching later, check your spreadsheet, because you, it, I, these are not next week, but they're coming up soon. And the same thing for Haydn and Neruda, uh, and Hummel is also on that list. If, you're, if you think, oh, that's not me, I don't have that, you might in two weeks, right? So... I picked more stuff that's from further out so that you have longer to practice it um, with some help, right? So that's what we did this week. Um, who knows what we'll do next week? Uh, hopefully people will play and I will have new things to play. And it, uh, I, I'm not going to do my own students stuff, I think, next week as much anyway, because uh, I want to play some, some of what I want to play. So we'll do probably some harder stuff. I think I'm going to get into some string etudes from the uh, Harris book and maybe some uh, Fern Reynolds etudes. Uh, those are two of my favorite things to play that are too hard for me. And uh, I think it would be interesting to somebody out there to see me struggle through a bunch of stuff that I don't know already. Uh, and uh, like we did maybe the first two streams. So anyway, that's, that's what I'm up to. Uh, thanks again for coming. And um, yeah, hope to see you next week.